Our next speaker um, giving a presentation entitled Being Practical About Climate Change, The Limits of Optimism um, is Michael Hanneman, who's a professor of economics and sustainability at Arizona State University, uh, where he is director of the Center for Environmental Economics and Sustainability Policy. He's also Professor Emeritus in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at UC Berkeley, uh, a member of the uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Professor Hanneman is, the, is an environmental economist who works in the areas of non-market valuation, water economics and policy, and the economics of climate change. He was founding director of uh, UC Berkeley's uh, Climate Change Center. He co-directed California's Climate Scenarios Project from 2003 to 2010, and he was a lead author in Working Group 3 of the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. A major focus of his current research is on climate change, uh, on climate change is on the inadequacy of conventional economic assessments of the potential damages from climate change, especially the understatement of the economic impacts of extreme events. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Michael Hanneman. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a clicker? It's right here. Oh, okay. It's a, a very great uh, pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, of course, I've known of Peter's work my whole professional uh, career. And also, um, uh, Berkeley celebrates its 150th anniversary this year, so it's a uh, young brother. Um, I want to, um, I, I'm going to be something of a, of a doubt of uh, cold water. Uh, you know, I agree with uh, what has been said, what Matt has uh, said. Uh, you know, but I'm not at all optimistic that we will uh, uh, meet the Paris target. Uh, and uh, you know, so the question is, how do we come into this situation? Um, and there are many reasons. Human nature, human frailty, uh, self-interest, lack of political leadership, and I think lack of awareness of what a, a more adequate economic analysis would uh, show, and I want to comment on uh, each of those topics. Um, I want to start with uh, a question. You know, so uh, various speakers have said, can we meet the Paris target? And the point is, sure we can. But this is why I uh, ask this question. You know, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? It can be done, but the light bulb has to want to change. Two more quotations. The famous one from St. Augustine. Let me be virtuous, but not just yet. And the quote attributed wrongly to Winston Churchill, which applies not only to Americans, uh, but to mankind. Uh, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. One piece is leadership. And I, uh, uh, California has been very fortunate in having two really wonderful governors, the current governor, Jerry Brown, but his predecessor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold um, announced his climate policy for California in 2005. I had the uh, um, honor of being on the platform with him. And I want to read some expert, uh, just two slides with excerpts uh, from what he said. Because I don't think any politician in the United States, any other politician, has delivered this message. And I believe this message is what's needed. So he said, he, he first of all talked about what we've accomplished and the march of progress and, and how that has benefited mankind. But then he went on, but th there's one area where we should turn the clock back so we can once again drink water from the faucet without giving it a second thought, watch our children play outside without struggling to breathe or using an inhaler, and one of Schwarzenegger's children suffers or suffered from asthma. So that was deeply personal. And then, you know, so we should be able to look out and see the mountains, see nature in the distance. And he continued, 
I say the debate is over. We know the science, we see the threat, we know the time for action is now. It's the next three uh, sentences which I think are crucial. That co what's going on is a threat to California and everywhere else around the world. This impacts California's water supply, the health of Californians, California's agriculture, California's coastline, California's forests. And then, and I think this is uh, also very artful, he said, in the decades past when burning fossil fuels caused this damage to the world, we didn't know any better. That was a, a mistake. But now that we do know better, we, if we don't do something, that would be an injustice. And this was, I think, an artful political framing. The issue is not who's responsible in the past and were we evil. The relevant point is once you know you're causing harm, it is utterly immoral to continue doing so without stopping. And I think that's a message uh, that uh, Obama, that, you know, that needs to be delivered and has not been delivered in the US. I think it, in effect, has come across in the EU. Uh, so this is just listing, uh, so I'm now going to approach this from economics, and I'm distinguishing the, what I see as the two topics, mitigation, how do we reduce and control emissions, and impacts and adaptation, how will, be, will we be affected, and what can we do to reduce those impacts. And there are two crucial asymmetries. So first, most of the economic literature, which goes back now the first paper in 1975, uh, but mainly since 1990, most of the literature is focused on mitigation, on how can we reduce emissions, how fast, how much will it cost, what are the best policies to bring it about, and so on. My own work has focused mainly on what is the damage uh, that's uh, going to result uh, as a consequence. And let me say, uh, there are going to be places and times which will benefit. I, uh, I grew up in Manchester, um, uh, in the northwest coast of England, and Manchester is uh, cold, damp, and miserable. And I like to say, with climate change, it will be um, warm, dry, and miserable. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, my point is, uh, there are places that will get benefits, and I don't want to uh, minimize that, but the overall effect, the net effect, is, uh, is negative. So, I'm going to argue that one of the weaknesses, uh, let me just back up, I think there are several weaknesses in the messages we have heard. It's not just we need better messaging, I don't think we have a well enough prepared message. Uh, one of them, as I say, is, message is we can do this, but you have to explain what will make us likely to do it. A second thing, uh, you know, uh, we have charts, uh, the, the graphs of what will uh, happen. You know, it'll get hotter, there'll be more uh, extreme events, there'll be more damage. How much more? Are we, uh, will there be, uh, you know, 1% more damage or 10% more damage? Because, and this is my main point, people are going to ask, is the cost I have to bear worth the damage I avoid? And so you have to tell me, you can't say more, you can't be qualitative. At some point you have to be quantitative. Now let me say, quantification has enormous problems and you can have uh, huge errors of uh, misplaced precision. I understand all that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to explaining to people why this outweighs that for them. And, and, and let me say, obviously, these are moral issues. These are moral issues. Um, but we know, you know, since November 8, 2016, judgments based on moral issues have become scarcer in this country than ever before. And so, all I can say is, I agree personally about the moral importance. But that's not going to be enough, and certainly not enough in this country, uh, to end the debate. Um, so, many people 
Some of the time are motivated by self-interest, and the question is we have to address issues of self-interest. So quantification is one issue. Let me say another issue is timing. Talking to people about what will happen in 2090. I have done this. I have, uh, as part of California's Climate Scenarios Project, and p many people say, I'm busy right now. We have a lot of problems. We have problems going back in will, with water to the 1940s. You know, when we solve those, come back and tell me about 2090. Um, and one of the messages, as I'll explain, is the near-term consequences associated with local extreme events are crucial, are overlooked, and I think will tip the balance, but they're not addressed effectively. I also want to say, while I'm in this uh, piss-pot mood, the IPCC is in many ways in ineffective and counterproductive. And that's because its goal is to summarize existing science. Uh, it doesn't commission new research, uh, and it doesn't conduct new research. It just conducts a synthesis. A crucial gap, the crucial gap, is between uh, 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 working group two on the impacts and working group three on the uh, economics. There is, not just in the IPCC, but in the larger scientific community, no effective interaction or minimal ineffective in interaction. And so the working group three focuses on mitigation because there's lots of research, but is an entirely inadequate on the, bet, you know, the value of uh, avoiding these damages. We need to quantify, we need to be more comprehensive, we need to focus on the near term. And the last thing is we need not just to recognize risk, but to evaluate risk aversion. Let me, uh, so my field is non-market valuation. Um, it's a field that uh, I've I've grown up with throughout my academic uh, uh, career. Uh, I entered graduate school in 1968, um, and it's uh, become widely used. It started in the environment. It's widely used for health, for cultural policy, for education, uh, for, for uh, development policy, social policy, and so on. It is anthropocentric. It is not rooted in morality. It is focused on finding the value that people place on things that they care about. And if they don't care about it, they may be immoral, but they will place the low value because they don't care about it. And so this is relevant if you're trying to assess self-interest. Um, and very quickly, people think economic value is price. Uh, if something is worth $7, that must mean its uh, price is $7. That is a misconception. Fundamentally, um, uh, the price is a measure of what it costs to get something. What it costs you to get something is not the same as what that thing is worth to you. There can be things that are cheap that mean an enormous amount to you. And that, that works of art that would cost $125 million that I wouldn't want in my toilet, they're so ugly. What something is worth to you is logically different from what it costs to you. Now, of course, when people make choices, they compare what it costs to what it's worth. If they buy an item, the cost is a lower bound on what it's worth. If they refuse to buy an item, the cost is an upper bound. But it doesn't measure what things are, are, are worth. The economic concept of, uh, of the value uh, of, uh, say, a commodity is the most money a person would be willing to pay to get the commodity or the minimum compensation the person would need to forego the commodity. It's simply what this commodity is worth to that person in comparison to money, which gives him other commodities. It's an exchange a person would make. It's idiosyncratic, it's subjective. Non-market valuation extends these notions to anything people, human beings, care about, whether these are market commodities or, or other things, the health, the natural environment, the, the planet. Same concept, but it's a thought experiment. If you could pay money and preserve something you care for, what is the most you would be willing to pay? Or if you could arrange to be given compensation by somebody for losing something you care for, what is the minimum uh, compensation. 
And when you look at impacts of climate change, some of them are market and some of them are non-market. And they all count uh, together. Um, and I'm not going to... Um, this is a, there are ways of doing, uh, ways of measuring market and non-market values. They involve assumptions. They involve data. They involve extrapolations. Uh, they are going to be fallible. Uh, but this is the case, uh, in my view. Obviously, you want to do the best you can. But non-measuring, because the measurement uh, is uncertain, is a mistake. Because then you can't present people with whether the costs are worth the benefits. Now, part of this is because of the scale of the problem. So, uh, the US government puts out a report every 10 years on the economic benefits of the Clean Air Act. I mean, an assessment of the net benefit. And, you know, that's health, many things. Those are, you know, that those are hard to value, but it's done. Nobody faints dead at the notion of doing an analysis. Climate change is so much worse because the scale in space and in time is much more difficult, much more uh, demanding. So it's going to be harder uh, uh, to do well. I want to emphasize a cost, uh, an economic concept that's in the literature, the social cost of carbon. And it's a uh, a thought experiment. If we emitted an extra ton uh, of carbon, say in 2018, it doesn't matter where in the world, but if, a, uh, if an extra ton of uh, CO2 was emitted, trace out how it will change the atmosphere, change out how it will change the, the climate, change, trace out how that will affect water supply, forests, health, food, um, you know, everything everywhere around the world. Use non-market valuation to try and uh, measure those in monetary terms, add them up, discount them, looking out two, three hundred years or whatever, and you calculate the discounted present value of the damage over the rest of time resulting from an extra unit of, of emissions now. The best estimate um, uh, put out by, the US, uh, by Obama uh, now is something like $45 a, a ton. The Trump administration knocked that down to uh, something like $6 a ton, primarily by, discount, by literally zeroing out impacts on the rest of the world. Uh, other than the United States. So it's a, it's a simple calculus. Uh, let's say the number is $6. Let's say it's $46. So each ton emitted anyway, including the US, the discounted present value for the rest of the world is $40. For the US, it's, uh, uh, it's $6. Um, the $46 is almost certainly an underestimate maybe by a factor of two or three or four. And I'll, I'll get at some of that, but I just wanted to put this in context. So why is the estimate low? I, so the, I want to emphasize, it's, it's a terrifically hard job. You're looking around the world, you're looking you know, a century, two century in the future. But it's not just that. It's a job that's being done badly, uh, in addition. Due to, I would say, a lack of imagination, um, and I want to talk about some of the conceptual issues that are overlooked that I think could be fixed. But there's the lack of funding, and as I say, the IPCC doesn't provide a platform, and nobody else is providing a platform, to improve, to do the research, and to bring the disciplines together um, to do a better job. So, um, let me go to the next slide. This is one indication. This is uh, from... Uh, uh, um, something I did. So, in the um, uh, th uh, third assessment, the Hadley model predicted uh, uh, under the two scenarios, let, let's take the two degrees, the B1 scenario, two degrees global warming. Um, if you looked at the warming in uh, California, that was 3.3. This was end of century or something like that. That was 3.3. Uh, but uh, the warming is uh, projected to be greater in summer than winter. So uh, it was 2.3 in winter and 4.6 in summer. Uh, that's the whole state. 
you know, from the mountains to the coast. If you look at the urban areas, San Francisco and LA, and if you look at the Central Valley agriculture, that's more like five degrees. The point I'm making is two degrees uh, global warming is five degrees in the summer, which is the critical period where most of the people live and work in California. And this is just one indication of how averages are misleading. Now, I could break it down more finely uh, uh, between different parts of California, but, but you get uh, my message. The disaggregation uh, makes a big difference. And you can forget the equations, let me say this in well. Suppose the warming is four degrees in uh, LA rather than two degrees. Well, there'll be more harm from four degrees than two. But the function is not linear, it's nonlinear. And the extra harm, so think of it this way suppose it's, uh, 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 suppose, let me change the number. Suppose the average is three, but in one place it's four, and in another part of the state it's it's uh, one, and so one and four um, average, uh, what, what am I saying? It, it's two in one part of the state, four in the others, and, and two plus four averages at three. So where it's two, there'll be less, uh, if, and, and if you would use the statewide average, where it's two, there'd be, you'd be overstating, there'd be less damage. Where it's four, you'd be understating, because four causes more damage than three. The amount by which you understate the damage when it's four rather than three is greater than the amount by which you overstate the damage when it's two rather than three, and that's what this uh, equation says. And that's true spatially, uh, that's true in time. This is, um, uh, 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 so let me explain. This is uh, data on, uh, count, uh, on uh, county GDP in the United States, for all the counties of the United States. Um, but the difference is the diagram on the, uh, on the right looks at states. The uh, uh, diagram on the left looks at counties. So there are whatever, 50 states and there are 3,500 counties. The horizontal axis is the number of days in the year where the temperature is um, um, min uh, minus, it's a five uh, uh, degree bin around minus 15, minus 10, 0, 5, 10, 15. So these are temperature bins. The last bracket is more than 35. And this is, uh, the vertical axis is how more having one more day in each of the categories affects GDP in the county. If it's positive, it increases GDP. If it's negative, it lowers it. The, gray, the, the, the black dots are the point estimates. The gray, is the, uh, the gray are the error bars. Compare, so what's different here is the spatial scale. Doing the analysis on the right-hand side, looking at states. Doing the analysis on the left-hand side, um, um, looking at counties. And when you, so I'm comparing state scale with county scale. So the counties are aggregated to states. You get a much uh, uh, less sharp message comparing the right. Most of the area on the right is gray. That is to say, you can't reject the hypothesis of zero effect until you get uh, to, I think it's um, 20, the last three cells. Not the last cell, but the 20 and 25 cell. 15. On the left-hand side, it's a much sharper, narrower confidence interval, and it's much more harmful. That's, so most of the existing studies use national data, not state data, not county data. And this aggregation masks the harmful effects of climate change. Quickly, uh, local extreme events. So, of course, there's an important literature, um, you know, on, on catastrophic global events, the changing of the thermal highland uh, circulation and so on. And, and the, those are important, and you don't want them to happen, no doubt about it. But I'm, my work focuses on what I call local extreme events. Local in space, you know, there's uh, fires in Arizona, but not California, not in the whole US or this, in the Midwest, but uh, not in the Southwest and so on. Um, they occur not every year, maybe, you know, they, so they're local in time and space. 
Now, my existing research, my hunch is that that's where most of the harmful effects over the next three, four, five, six decades will arise. I have one specific example uh, that I'll show you, and this comes out, uh, out of work with my uh, brilliant student, Wolfram Schlenker, professor at uh, Columbia. So we looked at the effect on, on, on um, farmland value, farms in counties throughout the uh, United States. Uh, actually, we looked uh, 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 east of the 100th meridian, so we're ignoring uh, uh, where irrigation is used. And we have three uh, uh, climate variables. Temperature uh, within the conventional uh, range for crops, 8 to 32 C. Um, but then we had extreme, so we calculated degree days within the conventional range, and then degree days above 34 C. So if you have one day where the daily temperature is 36 C, that's two degree days. If you have three of those, it's six degree days, etc. And then the third variable was precipitation during the growing season. We have 50 years of data. It's a very fine uh, uh, data set. We find essentially, uh, and then having estimated this, we use the um, Hadley II projections uh, for climate change for the U.S. We find, uh, so we have uh, two emission scenarios, A1, uh, A1FI and B1, and we look at uh, two periods, uh, one centered around 2035, that is the period 2020 to 2049, and the other centered around 2085, the end of the century, 27 to 2099. For the, for, um, for the near term, regardless, the first row, 80 to 90% of impact, of economic impact, is associated with extreme temperatures, with, with degree days above 34C. And everything else is really generously 20%, more like 10% of the impact. Now, why do I say this? Most of the existing economic assessments look at annual temperatures, um, uh, and they don't, pick, they, they don't focus on extreme temperature. The other picture is the one I showed you a moment ago. All of the action is in the last uh, f uh, you know, four points on this curve. That's, it doesn't matter if there's no warming uh, uh, around the average. It only matters if there's an increased frequency of uh, extreme heat. And I think this is... Uh, and that's what's happening, and that's what's going to happen. And so in order to move the conversation to what will happen in the near future, uh, we need to uh, do a better job. I want to talk about, I have, I think, two slides, oh, three, very quickly. This is about risk. Everybody knows that. There's an economic approach to measuring risk aversion. In other words, it's one thing to say this is more risky than that. Well, is it a good thing? No. You have to measure what the extra risk is worth. And there's a whole conceptual literature that underlies the economics of insurance. It's how much would you be willing to pay as an insurance premium to zero out this risk? And the existing economic literature doesn't calculate the risk premium that would be associated with events. And my own analysis suggests it could increase the damages by 50% or maybe by 100%. I want to, um, so I want to end with uh, just a, a couple of points. Let me show you this graph. There's a concept called downside risk aversion. So what's wrong with risk aversion? Risk, like say measured by variance, measures the chance of a downside outcome, but also the chance of an upside outcome. You may go bankrupt or you may win the lottery. Most people care about the bankrupt bit a whole lot more than they do, uh, avoiding that, a whole lot more than they do about winning the lottery. The financial literature in the 1960s developed what's called downside risk, where you weight more the downside risk. F when we're talking about climate change, most of this is downside risk. Here's an example. This is, these are the probability distributions of the amount of water that can be delivered to California. The black line is the historical distribution over 80 years of stream flow adjusted. Um, 
and the droughts are the low numbers on the, on the left. What we have is simulations with the PCM climate model, which is a medium sensitivity, uh, the blue lines, and the GFDL, which is a higher set climate sensitivity. The, with the blue lines, there's not much of a change compared to the black. With the red lines, both the low emissions B1, the dotted line, and the solid red line, the high uh, emissions, there is a change. It, but you know something? The variance almost does not change at all with either the red lines or the blue lines relative to the existing. The risk is transferred to the downside direction. You see? That downside risk, if you're risk averse, you'll be even more downside risk averse. And my analysis shows that that would be, in the example, um, my last slide. Speakers have said it would benefit society if we uh, switched to fossil, f if we abandoned fossil fuels, if we made the adaptations. It would, it, it, it would be beneficial to society. That's good, but it's not enough. The real issue is, do the people who bear the costs gain the benefits? Because if they don't, they will fight like hell to block you. Now, you can pay compensation, and, and, but we need to pay attention to the distribution. The fundamental problem with the McKinsey curve is it ignores the distribution. It says you can make money by uh, you know, using more energy efficiency and doing these things. I believe that's true. But what it doesn't demonstrate is whether the people who have to make the, bear the cost get those benefits. And we need to be much more sensitive to who gains who loses, how much, and when. Thank you.